the Bellum Temengor National Park forms the largest uninterrupted forest area on the Malay Peninsula. In this rainforest area, slightly larger than Luxembourg, there is not only rich bird life, but also tigers, tapirs, black bears, and many wild elephants. The jungle is divided in two by a highway. We are traveling with the Spanish zoology professor Campos Aceas, now resident in Malaysia, and his students who are committed to the protection of the elephants living here. Traces of them can be seen along the road, reason enough to stop and take samples of elephant dung. When we began working here, we thought that the road would be a barrier. So we have two big patches of forest on the north and the south, and then a, a road bisecting the, the forest from east to west. And then we thought that the road would be a serious impediment for the elephants to move freely. And what we are finding is that actually near the road there's a lot of food. So the forest has been cleared and then the, the road was built and there's some open space on both sides where grasses grow and where all the secondary growth is, is abundant. So then there's much higher chance to see elephants by the road than elsewhere. Not only because we are by the road, but because elephants are also by the road. Unexpected, but certainly intelligent behavior. It's difficult for us now to devise studies that can quantify how intelligent they are. We know they have a very, very complex uh, social life, and society involves intelligence. You need to be very intelligent to remember who is who, and to keep track of what has happened in the past, and make predictions about what could happen in the future. Uh, we know that they have very, very complex emotions, which is also a sign of intelligence. There are many studies on the plain behavior. So you know that plain is a way to learn things. Elephants grow very slowly. They take 15 years to reach uh, independence. And they play a lot. That means that they are learning many things. But it's difficult to quantify how intelligent they are. Elephants fitted with GPS transmitters are easy to locate via satellite. And so it isn't long before we are able to observe a herd of female elephants with their offspring very close to the side of the road. The tall elephant grass has lured them out of the forest thickets. The passing cars don't disturb the elephants, but because we have stopped to watch them at close quarters, they become restless. The situation is risky. It's time to drive on. She was picking up some of the grass and then throwing it to the back. So that shows that she's not pleased with our presence. So because of that, she might charge at any one time. If her trunk is curled up that way, she's ready to charge already. You will be surprised. They can really move very, very fast. Elephants prefer to get the huge amount of food they need in plantations rather than in the rainforest, where there is little food. This leads to repeated conflicts between elephant and man. Here, a so-called problem elephant is being anaesthetized so that it can be resettled in an uninhabited area. But do such resettlement projects work? And can they diffuse the conflicts permanently? In order to find out, Haimza Campos Asias, the tireless elephant protectionist from Spain, has fitted elephants with satellite transmitters after stunning them. This allows their migration behavior to be studied in detail. The anesthesia of large animals is not an easy task. The anesthetic has to be administered several times, and afterwards it takes a while for the animal to regain consciousness. It is quite likely to fall over. So relocating elephants is far from an easy task. In particular, analysis of the GPS data has shown that elephants usually return to where they came from and where there is the most food, in this case near the road, meaning close to civilization. The next day, Professor Ahimsa Campos Arceis sets out for more remote jungle areas that are accessible only by water. 
via reservoirs that were created here in the 1980s to generate electricity. So we're traveling over flooded jungle valleys, but the elephants living here have not allowed the water to interfere with their migratory behavior. On the contrary, it has shown that elephants can be quite good swimmers. After two hours, we reach our destination. From here, our journey leads us deep into virgin jungle. To our surprise, we find trails created not by people, but by elephants, whose traces we find everywhere. We know a lot about elephants, and yet it's not too much. We have studied them a lot, but we don't have very deep knowledge. And these are elephants. Most of biodiversity, we know nothing about them. So then, the, the science of um, ecology, behavioral ecology, is, is a relatively new science, and, and we have many things to study, and we don't know much about, about most of our subjects. What we do know, however, is that elephants contribute significantly to the diversity of plant species in the jungle. Because they eat plant seeds and excrete them mostly intact in a different place, they make a vital contribution to their dissemination. They need to be eaten by an animal to be dispersed. Yes. So in this one probably will be eaten by different herbivores like deer, tapir, but also elephants. But when the mango becomes larger and the seed becomes larger, only elephants can, can eat and the samples. Oh, look at this, beautiful. Oh. Okay, so we have, the seed is already germinating, you know, mm. can, can survive after going through, mm. through elephant guts. The scientists now walk on to one of the rare places probably visited daily by elephants and other mammals in the nutrient-poor jungle for centuries, the salt lick rare mineral salt deposits in the clay soil. Okay. Well, these were the animals like elephants come to consume soil, or sometimes the, the water that is around the, this soil. And there are several theories of what this happened. So then the, the most common idea is that it happens to, to obtain nutrients. So animals that feed on plants tend to be sodium limited. And a way to compensate is coming here, eating soil and getting all the sodium. Without salt, the animals could not survive. Elephants are very poor at detoxifying toxins from the plants. So the plants have, a, as a chemical defense, they have a lot of secondary compounds. And one way to deal with that is to consume soil that uh, you know, attaches to the toxins and helps to do digestion. And often you will find from herbivores, uh, pellets that are full of soil. Yeah, so why don't you take well, this is probably the, <laughs> this is the, only the one, best, uh, one yeah, the yeah. Right. A piece of fresh elephant dung is split down the middle. It hardly smells at all and is full of soil and plant fibers. If it's fresh, like this specimen, it also provides all kinds of other information to the researchers. In a makeshift laboratory in the jungle, the elephant dung is examined for stress hormones while as fresh as possible. The procedure is quite new and is being used here for the first time. The researchers want to find out whether these relocated elephants are showing symptoms of stress. At the same time, they install new camera traps at strategic locations, like the salt deposits. The cameras are equipped with motion sensors that are automatically triggered when animals come into their field of vision. Their location is precisely defined using GPS. Here, a camera has been attached to a tree that will soon bear fruit that elephants are fond of. A few weeks later, the researchers will come back to collect the images and evaluate them. And here they are, the fruit-eating elephants. In addition to elephants, which the cameras record time and again, the whole spectrum of life in the jungle is captured, from deer to water buffalo to curious monkeys. And as is to be expected in Malaysia, there are repeated visits from tapirs, the shy, rare nocturnal forest dwellers that belong to the horse family.
Malaysia is still on time to preserve a big amount of the, of the diversity. And as you say, it's a very developed country. They have the, the resources. There, there, is no, there is no extreme need to, to, you know, to continue, continue to exploit the resources without thinking. I think, I think there's a big opportunity in Malaysia to conserve wildlife and biodiversity in general. But wherever man is promoting economic development with the construction of roads and other activities, there is inevitably conflict with nature. In many ways, I always feel that our generation are losing the conservation battle, but it is still worth fighting to, to preserve as much as we can, or there's a, a significant amount of it for for the next generation. If Malaysia, so richly provided by nature, can find a balance between the pressure to develop economically and the need to preserve the diversity of wildlife, not only the human population, but also the elephants will be able to thrive.